Oh, wants to bite me. I'm actually going to get chomped. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, he's biting me. Oh, he's got me good. Mm. Ah, he's, he's, he's latched. He's latched. Ah, 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 he won't let go. Ah, won't let go. Oh, got one. Oh, yeah. Woo, yeah. This, believe it or not, is one of the most famous creatures ever featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. That's right, the original Bloodworm video now has over 73 million views. But in that original adventure, we did leave a few things on the table that are definitely worth revisiting. Namely, the venomous bite of this creature. Actually, did Coyote take a bite? Ow! Oh. Yay! Did it bite you? He got me! <laughs> I got that! He got me! I felt it! It was a little pinch! Let me see. Where'd he get you? Right there. Right in the crux of my finger. I think we can do better than just a pinch for one of the world's only venomous worms. In fact, we learned something very important about this creature between the last adventure and today that's going to help us achieve a bite on camera. But before I go getting myself chomped, for this new bloodworm experiment, we need to find a whole lot more worms than just this one. Let's keep digging. Bloodworms hunt for prey in the tidal mudflats of both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States and Canada. They have also earned the nickname sludge worm since their habitat consists of thick mud and quicksand that can easily swallow your boots whole. To find these slimy predators, worm diggers use special rakes to quickly peel back mud and reveal worms on the move that could be sold as prize fishing bait. And while they can be difficult to find, some of the best worm diggers in Maine can collect up to 1,000 worms a day, with the largest ones growing up to 15 inches long. After hours of digging and covered head to toe in mud and sweat, we fill the bucket and set the stage for one of the worst bites we've ever filmed. Welcome to the blood worm bite table. What I have in front of me here are five very large blood worms. No, these are not your granddad's night crawlers, folks. These are natural born killers. Armed with four venomous fangs and an appetite to match, we have been told that these worms pack one heck of a bite. Some people say that it's like a bee sting, and locals have even told us that they've seen worm diggers crawling out of the mud flats in near tears from being bitten by these carnivorous worms. But there is one key piece of information that we learned from the original bloodworm video to today, and that is you can actually head a blood worm. Similar to how a herpetologist would head a venomous snake to keep it from biting them, I will actually attempt to grab the proboscis once it shoots out and then intentionally inflict my first bite. And yes, I said first bite. There's gonna be more than one. Now what I'm going to try to do is head the proboscis, and while I'm attempting to do this, let's review some of the most interesting facts about this bizarre marine oddity. The bloodworm is a venomous segmented worm that hunts invertebrates and other marine creatures. Armed with four razor sharp fangs and a projectile mouth called a proboscis, they are voracious predators and are as aggressive as they are bizarre. One of the most shocking things about these worms is how normal they can appear and then in a split second transform into one of the most alien looking life forms you've ever seen. And as if this wasn't creepy enough, things get even worse. Once the bloodworm has its prey ensnared in those hooked jaws, it will inject it with a paralyzing venom that incapacitates the victim so it can be digested and eaten alive. This venom is chemically similar to that of a scorpion and is known to cause severe reactions in humans, including burning, tissue damage, and anaphylactic shock. Please do not attempt what you're about to see. Oh, almost got it. Ah, I missed it. Oh, 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 come on. All right, I got it. Oh, wants to bite me. That is the proboscis of one of the biggest blood worms I have ever seen. Holy moly, that's over a foot for sure. Okay, time to get bitten by one of the only venomous worms on the planet, the blood worm. Got a good hold on it. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! Oh! Yeah. Oh, God, he's on me. 
Oh, look at that. Ah, he won't let go. Ah, he won't let go. Ah. Oh, he's in. Go, oh, he's really on there, guys. I can't get him off. Ah, he's biting me. Oh, he's got me good. Yeah, he got me. Ah, oh, man, didn't break the skin. It was definitely latched into me, but its fangs I don't think are long enough to break the skin of my finger. I wonder if I try on a softer part. Let's try my wrist. It's a little bit thinner there, uh, a little bit softer. All right, here we go. Let's go in for the second bite on three. One, two, three. Oh yeah. Oh, yep, see him tug on the skin. Ah, oh, he's, he's, he's latched, he's latched. Ah, yeah. Mm. Oh, I can't get him off. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he's got me. You see that? Ah, oh, keep rolling, keep rolling. I'm gonna try to pry him off. Mm, he's really latched on. Mm. Come on, let go, let go. Ah, oh, he won't let go. Ah, oh, he won't let go. Gotta get him off. Ah. Oh. Oh yeah, that was a full on blood worm bite. Boy, that burns. Gosh, you get that shot? Got Those it. fangs were all the way latched in. Oh. Oh, oh that burns. Ooh, man, yes. You can see that there wasn't much blood produced from the bite, but I've got blisters forming and that's likely due to all the inflammation and swelling. I feel it in the nervous system. My wrist is screaming right now. Super painful burning sensation. A lot like a wasp or a bee sting. It's those fangs are like little talons and it just grabbed right through the skin and did not want to let go. They were like barbs on a fishing hook. They were just in there. And really, I wasn't able to get the worm off until it decided to relax a little bit and I pried it back. But those fangs are definitely sharp enough Yikes, that hurt. Now that we've witnessed what a single blood worm is capable of, let's see what happens when I submerge my hands in over a hundred of them. Do blood worms hunt in packs? We're about to find out. Before I attempt to feed my hands to these four fang terrors, let's take a look at what they did to some normal prey from the wild. While related and very similar looking to blood worms, the sandworm is not nearly as formidable. And after a short time in a small aquarium, we can see they are also very much their food. The venomous bloodworms attacked and broke down the sandworms quickly. And what you're seeing now are signs of both chewing and dismemberment, a clear sign of active predation. If you thought one bloodworm bite was bad, check this out. Whoa, look at all these worms. That is a container filled with over 100 blood worms in this tank. And I'm going to attempt to submerge my hands into this tank of blood worms for two minutes. All in an effort to figure out, do blood worms hunt in packs? Ready? On three. One, two, three. Oh, oh, that feels so weird. Ah, I just took my first bite. Hit, me on, the, hit me on the pinky. Mmm, oh. it was a bite and release. Oh, I could feel them. Uh, yeah, I could feel more proboscis going. It's like you could feel them tense up and then poof, it fires out. Ah, ah, the anticipation is killing me. If you could see them wriggling, they, they have their little sensory tips sensing their environment for anything that they can eat or get those jaws on. Oh, I could see a lot of them are shooting their proboscis out already. They sense something foreign in their environment. I gotta look away. This is like too much anxiety just looking at this container. This has gotta be the creepiest thing I have ever done in my entire life. Just so disgusting, feeling all those worms wriggling around my fingers. One thing that we noticed earlier is that as soon as one of them fires their proboscis, it seems to create a rapid fire effect. They all do it at the same time. They're going crazy. They are. I feel them wriggling around my fingers. Oh man, oh yeah. Ah, 
Got another one. Mm. Oh my goodness. So creepy. All right, how much time left? 30 seconds left. All right, this has gotta be the longest two minutes of my life. Two minutes feels like an eternity. Ah, oh, 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 the blood worm bite tank. Oh, this is horrible. Give me a countdown. Five. Ah, four, got me again. Three. That's three. Two. One. Ah. Oh. <sighs> Definitely got nailed on the pinky on this side. And I got two nips between my fingers here and here. Definitely got nipped three times. Wow, that was weird. What a crazy day on the Brave Wilderness channel. Well, I don't know if we can definitively say that bloodworms like to hunt in packs, but I'll tell you this, they sure don't mind sharing a meal, but man, that original bite, that was a serious, serious chomp from a bloodworm. It is absolutely swollen and very tender to the touch. I have a feeling I'm gonna be in pain for quite a while on that one. And I was absolutely correct. The bite of a bloodworm was no joke and ended up becoming one of the most painful experiences I've endured so far. Overnight, the swelling increased dramatically and the burning around the bite spread through my hand and up my arm, nearly locking my wrist. Then, days after the initial pain subsided, I had a secondary reaction where the bite zone flared up with an aggressive rash and itched at least twice as much as poison ivy. In all, it took three weeks to heal from the bloodworm venom. And I'm here to officially say the scary rumors of bloodworms are 100% true. So while these creatures are an important part of the intertidal ecosystem and a valued resource for fishing towns across Maine, you absolutely want to avoid their bite at all costs. Exclamation point. As steam rises off a frigid ocean and light reveals a jagged maze of shoreline, we begin our search for a fire below the surface. The smoldering abyss created by this uncharacteristically cold Florida day is a fitting backdrop for the home of a mysterious creature that possesses one of the fiercest stings beyond the tide. Hundreds of thousands of species of worms can be found all over our planet. And while some of them are well known for their bizarre abilities, the fireworm stands alone. This bizarre porcupine-like worm that feasts on coral and small crustaceans is covered in thousands of sharp spines that can ignite burning pain with just the slightest of touch. This armor fends off predators so well, almost nothing will eat them. And from the reefs of the Caribbean, to the rock pools of the Mediterranean, and sometimes depths of up to 300 meters, the fireworm is spreading rapidly into new environments. And so too is the legend of its fiery sting. In this video, I will put myself to the ultimate test to learn about this marine oddity by enduring its painful sting twice. I will suffer through this experience in hopes to answer the ongoing scientific question is the sting of the bearded fireworm actually venomous, or is it simply just a flesh wound? Do not attempt what you're about to see. This is going to be extremely painful. There it is. All right, it's time to go get stung. Here we go. That is a very good sized fireworm. And oh boy, does it look intimidating. And yes, welcome to another sting experiment here on the Brave Wilderness Channel. This time, we're going to attempt to solve a mystery, a bit of a scientific question as to whether or not the fireworm is indeed venomous. All right, there we go. You can see the worm so much better. This is indeed a true worm. You can actually see the segments lining the entire top, and it's a lot more closely related to a sandworm and a bloodworm than some of the other marine organisms out there on the reef. But unlike most worms, it has very unique defense mechanisms. There are thousands and thousands of these small, tiny hair-like spines 
lining the worm's body. In fact, they release so easily, I can actually see a lot of these spines floating in the water above it. This is where it gets its name, the fireworm, because those spines are so sharp and easily projected, anything that even brushes up against the worm's body gets inflicted by a searing pain. I have heard from many reputable sources that this is worse than a lionfish sting, and it's worse than a man of war sting, and all the other stings in this marine environment behind me. You'll notice, firstly, that it's very colorful. That aposomatic coloration indicates that it is extremely toxic. Not only potentially venomous, but it's also poisonous. Being poisonous and venomous are two very different things. Poison has to be absorbed or ingested into the body, where venom is actually injected by means of a tooth, a stinger, or in this case, a spine. But beyond the toxins that we know are contained within this worm, let's talk a little bit about the symptoms from the sting of a fireworm. And this is from a scientific journal written in 2017. Acute, intense stinging pain, itchiness, numbness, and swelling that can last up to several weeks. Symptomatic reactions such as nausea, cardiac, and respiratory problems can occur. Dang, that would be bad. And it's so interesting to me that even the scientific community, the scientists that study these creatures, haven't been able to figure out definitively if they're venomous or not. So with that being said, it's now time to conduct our sting experiment. And here's how it's going to go down. While stinging myself twice, once on each arm might sound crazy, it will be absolutely necessary to conduct this sting experiment, where I will treat one arm as if the fireworm sting is venomous and the other as if it were not. In theory, if venom is present, the two separate treatments should result in different outcomes in both pain and visible damage. <sighs> okay, I'm about to take one of the most painful stings of all the marine ecosystem. Oh, look at it flare up. Wow, look at that defense mechanism. Oh my goodness. See all those spines flare out, ready to eject? And it's not going to take much, just the slightest brush up against the fireworm and it's gonna be instantaneous. Oh man, I am nervous. I am feeling the nerves go now. Oh boy, all right, let's put my arm in the stink tank. Okay. I'm Mark Vins and it's time to get burned by a fireworm. Here goes nothing. Oh, that looks bad. Here we go. On three, ready? One, two, three. Ah! Oh yeah, he got me. He got me. Oh! Yeah, I could definitely, I can feel it, ooh. Yeah, it's almost like uh, little electrical pulses going through the skin. You can even see, oh wow, like right away, there are all kinds of spines up and down my skin. But man, it is starting to intensify. It's like little shock pulses, like pop, 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 going through my skin. All right, this is starting to hurt. Oh man, like, oh yeah, that, that super burns, that burns. Holy cow, all right, I'm gonna do the second one, guys, because I don't know how much longer this is gonna be tolerable. Oh man, oh yeah, that, ah, ooh. Okay, guys, we gotta do the second sting fast. Ooh. All right, here we go. Sting number two from the fireworm. Here we go. Right arm in the sting tank. Time for my second dose of fireworm spikes. Here we go, you guys ready? Oh. Yep, I can see him. Oh yeah, all through there, same spot. This arm, oh yeah, you can start to see my arms drying out. See all the quills, see all the spines, all the redness. This one's about to look just the same. All right, now, whew, taking the stings, let's get the remedies out. Oh, don't do that, don't, oh man, that hurt worse. Yeah, do not blow on them. Oh. Oh, searing like a hot needle. I tell you what, guys, I can tell right away, this isn't just irritant. There's something else going on, for sure. Woo! 
Oh man, you can really see the inflammation starting over here. Ah! Oh, mighty. First thing you want to do if you are stung by a fireworm is nothing. You do not want to rub the spines in deeper with your other hand because you're only going to inflict more pain onto your hand itself. What we want to do right now is wait for my arms to dry and then we are going to use the adhesive technique to remove as many of those spines as we possibly can. Ah, yeah, man, that's, that is bad. That is really bad. Oh man, it is getting intense. Ah, oh. The adhesive technique we're going to do on both arms. This is the same thing you're going to want to do to the stings. If they're venomous or not, I'm gonna to try to rip out as many of those spines as I can. Hopefully this causes not too much irritation and gives me a little bit of relief. Here we go. Oh, that is tender to the touch. Oh, ready? Okay, I've got the adhesive pretty well on there. One, two, Yeah. Woo. Okay, I got a lot of them actually here. Man, I taped it a good job. At this point, we're gonna and go in for side two. Here we go. Same thing. One, two, three. Gee. <gasps> mm. That really hurt. The good news is I think I got them all. Yep. You can see, got the spines out again. Now comes the second step, and this is only for the venom treatment. Like we said in the beginning, one side we're treating as if it's venomous and one side we're not. So the right side now is totally done, but the left side we are gonna mark with a V. You may have noticed the pain I'm experiencing is coming in waves, which is another indication that something chemically and perhaps venomous is going on. But to measure the visual reaction, I will mark one arm with a V for venom treatment and then draw boundaries on both sting sites to see if the swelling expands or contracts over the next 24 hours. Let's go ahead and treat the left side as if this was venomous. First thing we wanna do is we wanna apply some household white vinegar. Vinegar has the ability to render any venom that would be on the surface of my skin inert. Oh man, it feels cold to the touch and that actually feels good. And we're gonna leave this vinegar on here for another five to 10 minutes, and then we're gonna to go to step two of the venom treatment. That is hot water. Oh, yeah. Wow. So far, even from the treatments alone, every indication, signs are pointing towards venom. The heat affects the actual structure of the venom itself, rendering it almost harmless and a lot easier for your body to digest and take care of. Uh, at least one of my arms is already feeling better. Can't say it for the right arm. That arm still hurts a lot. Oh, you do not want to experience the pain of a fireworm firsthand like this. This is bad. All right, well, there we have it. Usually at this point in the video, I would give you my thoughts and we'd see you on the next adventure, but we really want to see how this experiment plays out overnight. So I'm gonna head back to camp and I'll see you guys again in the AM so we can compare both of these stings next to each other, see if there's any difference. I tried everything I could to put the pain out of my mind, but just laying there in my tent, my arms ached with increasing waves of agony as sweat poured out of my body all night long. Morning couldn't come soon enough because I knew the only thing that would make the pain go away was time itself. I could tell you this much, I am still in quite a bit of pain. And even wearing this shirt hurts. Like any contact with the stings feels terrible. And get this, it actually rained last night, so I got water in my tent on top of it all. So while I am feeling a little bit better, the sting damage is actually pretty significant. The results visually speak for themselves. The arm that we treated is almost healed at this point. I mean, you have some localized redness here. It still hurts, it's not done, but visually, you can see that the swelling is down. The actual inflammation is contracted to within the site from yesterday where the arm on the right 
has expanded beyond the site from yesterday and the inflammation is serious. It is very tender to the touch, much more so than the arm on the left. There is some other evidence that I wanna talk about that is really important to my ultimate decision of determining the venomous nature of this animal. First thing is the obvious feeling, the sensation of the sting itself. It was a delayed reaction. When I first made contact with my skin in the tank, I almost didn't feel like anything was even happening. But within a minute, I felt that first sign of intense burning and it only got worse. It built and built and built until on both sting sites, I felt like there was almost like an electrical fire underneath my skin. But this arm, the one we treated like it was a venomous sting, I actually saw these sites move and we have a picture to show you. So you can see there that it was well beyond this mark. That is a very interesting indication that there was something chemically happening underneath the skin and moved that sting site beyond that line and then back again. I would have to say, given all of the evidence of this sting test, I am convinced that this is indeed a venomous creature. And yes, being stung or burned by a fireworm not only hurts, but is the result of envenomation. I hope you enjoyed this experiment with fireworms, but more than anything, I hope you yourself never have to experience the burn from this marine creature, because I can guarantee you it packs a major wallop. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's time for us to release our fireworm back off into the wild and head off for another adventure. Oh man, I am super excited. The creature that we're looking for tonight is probably one of the most bizarre animals that could be found in Australia. And we have featured some interesting things over the years on Brave Wilderness, but I can promise you nothing compares to the turtle frog. We needed rain to find this frog and the rains have come. You are not going to miss this. Finding a turtle frog is almost impossible because you have to be in the small remote desert they live in Western Australia while it's raining. And this only happens a few times a year. Yes. Yes! Next to no footage exists of this species. If we find one, this will be the very first high quality footage ever seen. Oh, stop the car, I see something on the road. First animal of the night, a really cool lizard. Oh my gosh, it's got a huge tick on him though. I'm gonna try to pull this off. Look at that, got a tick. Oh my gosh. You see that? That is a big tick. And that is a really cool lizard. Very good sign for our search tonight. We're not exactly looking for shinglebacks, but this one was crossing the road, so we wanted to move them out of the way. You're welcome. All right, let's let you go off the road so you can continue on your way, and we'll continue on ours. This rain has the animals on the move. Like all amphibians, turtle frogs need moisture to survive and to breed. That is why they come up to the surface after it rains. Without this rain, the frogs will remain buried beneath the ground and impossible to find. To make matters worse, turtle frogs only come to the surface at night. We're going to have to look and listen closely to even have a small chance at spotting one. All my life, I've been a frog nerd, and I've been able to track down iconic species like the red-eye tree frogs and poison dart frogs of Central America. And I've also gotten hands-on with all different kinds of toads, from giants, oh, wow, to the most colorful, got it, like this extremely rare harlequin toad. However, the turtle frog has always been my grail animal, and tonight is the first time in my career I'll have a shot at catching one. But if we're going to do that, I'll have to rely on all my years of experience and animal catching tricks to track one down. Perfect habitat for the turtle frog. See that right there? That sand substrate. Turtle frog, it burrows down up to three feet below the surface, so it really needs the sand to be able to do that. Okay, let's keep looking. We're definitely on the trail now. It's really a miracle in itself that we got prime turtle frog conditions tonight. Like seriously, all week long, the forecast called for clear skies and no rain. But tonight, out of nowhere, the rain rolled in. And I have to say, it's making this adventure feel like destiny. Oh, guys, I got something. All right, so what you're looking at there is a spiny tail gecko named for the spines on the tail, which are actually just modified scales and they're soft. They're not sharp at all. Now these geckos have a pretty unique defense mechanism where they're able to actually secrete a chemical mixture from their tails. They like whip it at the predators trying to eat them and it doesn't taste very good. The eyes of a gecko are probably some of the coolest eyes on the planet. They actually don't have eyelids, so they have to lick 
their eyeballs to keep them moist. Can you imagine that, licking your own eyeball? Sure glad we have eyelids. Love these geckos. Okay, we're gonna let this gecko go back in the bush and keep looking. Well, that's a good sign. We're continuing to see new creatures. Guys, guys, I got one. Look at this frog. Holy cow, that is cool. Wow. We found our first amphibian of the night. It's not the frog we're after, but that is a great sign. That means that we're getting enough rain for the amphibians out here to come out of the soil. This is the Western Spotted Frog, and just like turtle frogs, they only come out just after a rainstorm. This is not the frog we're after, but it's a good start. Let's let this one go and keep searching. Perfect conditions. We just gotta keep looking. Got the rain, we're in the right spot. I've already seen one species of frog. This is like the sweet spot. This is what we need. Got everything except the turtle frog itself. After hours of searching, we weren't seeing any signs of turtle frogs. Luckily, my experience has taught me sometimes the best way to find the frog you're looking for is with your ears. Did you guys hear that? Shh, shh, shh. I, I think I heard one. Yep. Did you guys hear that? Um, one more. Let's see if we can hear it one more time. If we hear it again, we'll try to find it. I think that's one, guys. Let's try to canvas this area in front of us here. Stop calling. We must be right next to him. Got him. Got a turtle frog. Holy mother. Oh my God. Look, there he is. There it is. I cannot believe we found the frog. Oh my. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hello. Come here, buddy. Oh my gosh. We have come so far to find this species. There is the turtle frog. Yeah, baby! Woo! <laughs> what are the freaking odds? Guys. Oh my gosh! I cannot believe we got one. Oh. Hello. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? This is one of the coolest creatures I have ever laid my eyes on. Let's just appreciate this super unique creature. What you're looking at is some of the first HD footage ever recorded of a turtle frog. I mean, this species is so rare, there's very little information to find about them. But here's what we do know about this bizarre little frog. Let's start with the name, turtle frog. Named for its appearance, the most unusual frog I have ever seen, but look at its head. That dome-shaped head with the black beady little eyes and then the circular body. Looks like a turtle without a shell. This is one of the most unique looking frogs you will ever see. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt's relative. Some people say it looks like a, a little wad of chewing gum and it certainly looked like that when we first saw it. I have wanted to film. I have wanted to find one of these frogs for my entire career. This is a, a big, big moment for me. If you can't sense my excitement after this, this is about as big as it gets for a frog nerd like me. Hi, buddy. Look at that pudge. Are you kidding me? Has to be one of the most unique looking frogs, but probably the cutest frogs as well. 
super pudgy, super soft. Feels like a, a water balloon almost. And when it's walking across my hand, you can really tell how much liquid is in the frog. It's like a, a deflated water balloon, but it is a very delicate frog, but it's somewhat stout. Got a lot of power in those legs. I can feel it when it's crawling across my hand. It uses its stocky arms and legs to burrow into the soil. It really is incredible how something so small and soft can dig over three feet underground. And actually here, let me get out. I'm gonna take my pack off and uh, get out a little bit of water because I don't want to dry out the frog. One of the things you always want to make sure you do when handling any amphibian is make sure you don't dry them out and this water will, will help. Oh, hey, came to life there. Hey, buddy, it's all right. Oh my goodness. Endemic to Western Australia. It can only be found here, but that's not where the oddities end. In fact, the oddities begin with this species when it's born. It's one of the few species of frogs on the planet that does not have a tadpole stage. This frog begins its life with a full set of hands and legs. What's also unique about this species is that they have one of the largest eggs of all frogs in Australia. In fact, five centimeters is as big as they grow, and this frog is approaching maximum length. Now, there's a certain period of year where at the tail end of it uh, that it's breeding and it will actually call. That's how we were able to find this frog. And it was definitely a team effort. We've got Max with us here. Uh, from Australia Wildlife Encounters. Max and I were slowly honing in on this little frog, and then I crouched down and there it was, just like you saw it right there <laughs> underneath the bush, looking right back at us with those beady little eyes. And it was so unlikely for us to find this frog, guys. The rains were not supposed to come, and sure enough, they appear today almost like out of thin air a front came in, provided enough moisture for us to have a chance to put this frog in front of the cameras. And I am so excited you guys get to see it. Now, we think this is a male because of the way it was calling. And when they're mating, they have an extended honeymoon. Once a turtle frog locates its mate, they will both burrow together for months before actually breeding and depositing their eggs. This is a, a very unique species, guys. There's not a ton of information and very few studies of this frog. So when it comes to filming animal oddities, it doesn't really get any better than this. And I am just over the moon right now that we were able to come out here our first time in Western Australia, our first time in turtle frog territory against the odds. And sure enough, we were able to find one. Oh man, I am so, excited we got to show you guys the turtle frog what a cool frog this is guys are you kidding me tell me in the comments section if you've seen a cooler frog than the turtle frog i challenge anyone out there to name a more unique species of amphibian because i do not know of one all right let's go put this frog back and head in for the night man that was awesome we are searching these tide pools off the coast of eastern australia for the most toxic fish on the planet. The stonefish is notorious for having the most painful sting in all of nature. And today, I'm going to get stung by a stonefish. But first, we've got to find one. Let's get looking. It's going to be very hard to find the stonefish because in addition to their legendary sting, they are masters of hiding. The key to this is going to be to move slow, methodically, and to not step on the stonefish. You could be looking right at a stonefish and not even realize it. And that's why so many people step on them by accident. But stonefish aren't all we have to look out for. This isn't the only animal that could do you harm here in the Typhoons off of Australia. We also have cone snails and the blue ring octopus, one of the most lethal creatures in the world. And not only is it risky just being out here, but we also have to beat the clock. The tide is coming in fast and this whole area is about to be completely underwater. So if we want to catch a stonefish, we need to do that before it happens. Everything looks exactly the same. This is gonna to be tough.
right there. You see it moving? That is the stonefish. And I never would have seen that fish if it didn't give itself away by moving. Holy smokes. Now these fish are so toxic, they don't really have a flight response. I'm gonna attempt to catch the most toxic fish in the world with my bare hands. All right, here we go. Wow, there it is. That is the stonefish. Look at that tide pool monster. I can't believe we found one. I mean, it looks like a living rock. I never would have spotted this fish if it didn't move. The fact that it swam a little bit there is the only reason I was able to catch this fish. And you can see how docile this fish is. It knows just how toxic it can be. Wow. But the table is set for what will be likely the worst sting I ever take. Placing the stonefish in the tank hit my nerves hard. I'm about to get stung by a stonefish. Stonefish stings are said to be one of the most painful experiences a human can endure. And I've already experienced my fair share of fish stings. One from the most common fish sting, which is the lionfish. Ah! Oh! And the other from the scorpion fish, which is the most toxic fish sting in North America. Oh! Yeah, he got me. Oh! Each sting was painful, but I was certainly able to tough it out with basic treatment. However, each of those fish fall far short of the danger from the stonefish. Not every day you get to carry around the world's most toxic fish in a tank. This fish might just have the worst sting in the entire animal kingdom. Man, my nerves are firing right now. Just looking at this fish is so incredibly cool. Look at all the growths all over its body definitely earns its name, the stonefish, a master of camouflage. All right, let's go hands-on once again with the stonefish. The reason I can handle this fish is because it can only sting from the spines on top. Wow. This fish has developed the most potent fish toxin in the world. The toxin is only to defend itself. Unfortunately, as you can see, it is so docile that it's very easy for people to step on these fish. And that is the most common way people are stung by the stonefish. The toxin of this fish not only induces extraordinary pain, it can actually cause muscle spasms and eventual paralysis. And there have even been reported deaths from stonefish stings. But now I think it's time to see how this fish injects its venom. I'm going to just pour out this water. Gonna use this little tank here as a platform. This fish is perfectly fine being out of the water for extended periods of time because they've adapted the ability to actually hold water in their gills. It's not uncommon to see stonefish just laying on the rocks in these tide pools. So in the little bit of time that we have it here in front of the cameras, totally fine. All right, so I brought with me a piece of neoprene. I'm going to use this piece of neoprene to simulate skin so I can show you what would happen if you stepped on the stonefish. This animal has the ability to fire its venom into the wound created by its spine. That's why people who are envenomated and step on these stonefish end up in such a bad situation. It's not only that it's the most toxic venom, it's that you also get the most volume. Look at how sharp that spine is. Okay, in order to do this properly, I do need to get out some eye protection, so I'm gonna do that quickly. This venom, it has enough toxin in it to cause vision problems and perhaps even blindness. All right, let's see in slow motion how these spines inject venom. I'll do these top two, guys, ready? Here they go. One, two, three. Oh, wow. Look at that. And it's like blue. Holy cow, look at how much venom just came out of that fish. And let's do another one, do that one more time. Oh my gosh, guys, the spines are blue. And once those spines are out, they stay out. And they're ready to defend. All right, let me try these uh, spines on the back here. One, two, three. Wow, that is what would be inside of your foot if you were to step on a stonefish. Now, it will regenerate its venom. This doesn't hurt the fish at all. And you can see these sheaths will just slide right back up. 
but holy cow. I gotta take a minute and process what I just saw. Oh, that is bad. I won't lie, I'm getting pretty nervous right now. This is something you should never do. I've consulted experts, people who have been stung. I've done my research, I've done my homework, but even still, I am extremely nervous about what is about to happen. It's said that this is the most painful sting in the world. <sighs> Wish me luck. The moment has come. It's time to be stung by the world's most toxic fish. I am borderline terrified. I've thought long and hard about whether or not to even go through with this, but I'm doing this today because through my research on the stonefish, I have found a lot of misinformation out there. There is a lot of stories that pretty much describes certain death if you're stung by a stonefish, and that's just simply not the case. While this toxin in the base of its spines is extremely potent, it is thermal liable. So if treated properly and if needed with medical attention, you will survive the sting of a stonefish. Most of the victims that end up dying from stonefish stings, but has more to do with the pain and shock that leads to cardiac arrest. This venom is meant to cause you pain. But I have brought the antidote with me today. A thermos filled with hot water that's around 114 degrees Fahrenheit, a compress to hold over the wound, and then of course, if I do go into any state of anaphylactic shock, I always carry with me an EpiPen. We are about three minutes drive from an emergency room. So even if the worst case scenario does unfold today, I should have plenty of time to be able to get to emergency medical attention. All right, my plan today is to take a micro dose of stonefish venom. The venom from that neoprene trial is already coating the spikes. So they are locked and loaded, ready to go. When it's all said and done, this should be just extraordinarily painful for me and hopefully very educational for you. This is going to likely be the worst sting that I ever take. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the stonefish, the most toxic fish in the world. All right, I'm gonna go with this front spine here. Ready? This spine. On three. One. Two. Three. Ah! Mmm. Yep. Mmm. I already feel burned. I could feel it spreading up my finger right now. And it does not feel good. Wow, the tide is coming in. All right, here, let's, mm, hang on. Mm, let's move out of here, the tide's rolling in. You okay, Mark? Yeah, hang on, I'm gonna come over here. Andrew, put the fish back in the tank, man. Mm. Oh, right there is where, where the spine went in. God, immediate fire spreading up my fingers. I can already feel it in these, these three. Mmm. Do you help Mark or are you okay? No, I'm okay, I'm okay right now. It's like a different magnitude of pain. It is like throbby, achy. Mm. Hang on, I gotta walk it off. Yeah. I'm gonna try to tough it out for a little bit. I wanna see how far the venom spreads before I start applying the first aid. This is borderline unbearable. Mmm. Oh my gosh. Mm. Let me know when you need the watermark. I'm just like, it's making me nervous. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely drew a little bit of blood. Oh, and it is hot. It's like closing my hand is becoming hard. Mm. Ah, yeah, it's spreading. It's like all up the back of my hand now. Mm. I think I need to go for the hot water, guys. I don't want this to spread anymore. I'm going to the hot water. There we go. Stonefish is good. Now I need to fix myself. So this hot water will actually stop the venom from working and should help my pain. Every bit as painful as advertised. I never want to do that again. And I need to get more hot water on this sting. And hopefully the pain subsides, but it's still increasing for me. Tingling pain continued to build and spread up through my shoulder 
all the way to my neck. Even a month after the sting, I still have numbness and tingles in my fingers. The immediate pain wasn't enough to send me to the hospital, but as we released the stonefish, I could imagine what would happen if a full load of its venom were to go in my foot. That instance would send you directly to the hospital. And if you're ever stung, please, you should seek medical attention as soon as possible. Needless to say, the stonefish certainly lives up to the legend of being the most painful fish on the planet. I'm hearing a lot of bad information out there about how to treat a jellyfish sting and what the sting is actually doing. So when I decided that we were gonna make this video, I was like, what jellyfish should I get stung by? A little tiny one out on a reef? Oh no, I need to go big. We're talking the baddest, the terror of the ocean, the Portuguese. <laughs> That one, yes, that's exactly what we're looking for today. Now, when the wind blows a certain direction, the Portuguese man o' war will actually wash up on the beaches here in Florida, sometimes by the hundreds. Actually, I think I see one right up there. Oh, all right, here we go. Those are two pretty good looking man o' war right there. Woo, careful guys, don't wanna get hit by, woo, that is dangerous. If I get whipped by that, we're gonna get stung way, whoa way sooner than I want to. So everyone knows this is the end for them. When they wash up on the beach here, they will unfortunately dry out and that's kind of it, circle of life. So the fact that we're taking these two today for our experiment is totally a good use for their end of life. And boy, do they look beautiful. But sometimes with beauty comes pain. And this is a super painful jar. All right, let's head up out of the wind and take a closer look. I remember these tables, except all of the shoots before this one, I was on the other side of the camera. So yeah, this is uh, a little bit different than I'm used to. In this bucket, we have a variety of different sting remedies. Some of them good, some of them not so good. And that's the reason why I wanted to make this video in the first place. Let's talk about the organism, the creature, the Portuguese. <laughs> Are we gonna do that every time? the Portuguese man o' war. Although it looks like one, the Portuguese man o' war is not actually a jellyfish. It is a siphonophore. Unlike a jellyfish, which can survive on their own, siphonophores are a group of colonized organisms made up of cloned cells. Each group are responsible for specific tasks to keep the man o' war alive. Some cells form the float, which suspend the organism on the water's surface and create a sail to move with the wind. Others are responsible for hunting prey, and this is where we meet, the venom-filled nematocyst. These small but potent cells cover the man o' war's stinging tentacles by the thousands, and within each is a spiral-shaped barb which literally blasts out when making contact with its victim. When these barbs penetrate the skin, they release a cocktail of enzymes very similar to snake venom. These enzymes are designed to incapacitate prey, and in my case, will cause instantaneous pain. This animal is notorious for its sting. In fact, it stings thousands of people here in the state of Florida every single year. I luckily have never taken a sting until now. Time for me to take two stings from the Portuguese man o' war. In order to compare the effectiveness of the most famous remedies for being stung by a man o' war, today I'll be taking two stings side by side on the same arm. One of them to be treated with urine, the controversial yet universally accepted cure to all marine creature stings, and on the other, I will spray white vinegar, the suggested first aid from a University of Hawaii research article. Then, while enduring the venom from both stings, I will attempt to describe which of these two remedies relieves my pain the best. Two sting sites, two different antidotes, which one works the best, you're about to find out. Please do not attempt to do what I'm doing here today. Um, oh gosh, I'm so nervous I can't even get a hold of it. Okay guys, I think I got it. You ready? Ready. Okay, here we go. About to take, oh God, that looks horrible. Whew, man, I'm getting nervous. Here we go. About to take two stings from the Portuguese man of war. You guys, get your shots ready, because this is only going to happen one time. Tear of the ocean. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! Yep. It's getting me. Oh, yeah. I can feel it. Ah! Ooh. Ooh. That's like electric. Yeah, that's one. 
wow, it burns right away. Okay. Second sting. I gotta do this fast before it gets too bad. Ready, guys? Ready? All right. One, two, second sting. Three. Ah, yep. Oh, man, that one nailed me. Oh. Okay, yep. So, instant, uh, almost tingly, electrical feeling sting. A lot different than a bee sting or a wasp. Oh man, those are really getting in there. I could feel it now. Now, likely there are still hundreds of nematocysts that are, oh yeah, they are erupting as I'm talking to you right now. I could feel them individually firing, like pow, 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 like a series of bullets going into my skin. Woo, yeah. Hmm, yeah. You can see it getting red on both sites. Now, stink site one up here at the top, stink site two down here at the bottom. I can actually see remnants from the tentacles and those likely have many nematocysts in them. And it is getting worse and worse with every second. Oh man, this is bad. You do not want to get stung by a Portuguese man of war. If I were a fish right now, I'd be in big trouble. In fact, I would likely already be in complete paralysis and this man of war would be reeling me in for dinner. Okay, let the healing begin as they say. All right, there is two steps to this. One, spray on the agent. Two, use a plastic card because you wanna scrape off as many of those nematocysts that have yet to explode as you can. First sight, vinegar. Here we go. Okay. Oh yeah, smells like vinegar. Now the one I'm dreading, gross. This is so disgusting, this is so nasty. All right, you guys are a little downwind, so you might wanna prepare to duck and cover. All right, here we go. Oh man, I don't wanna splash my face. Oh, 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 it stinks. Oh, okay, that's enough. Scraping off those active nematocysts is certainly part of the equation, so you don't wanna forget that step. I can actually see my skin pulsing. You guys see my skin going up and down there? All the nerves in my arm right now are probably just screaming like, ah, intruder, we have venom. I feel so much better already. It feels like I'm on the road to healing. Man, it still burns though. So now it's just more of the burning. Okay, yeah, I think I'm, I'm ready to make a, a declaration of sorts at this point. Vinegar, not only more sanitary, but definitely wins the contest. This is by far the least of the two when it comes to pain. The urine sight, not only is it absolutely disgusting, but it definitely burns a little worse. And I could definitely feel a distinction between the two. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it. Vinegar is the definitive antidote that you want to use if you want to neutralize stinging cells on your skin. Urine, not your best friend when it comes to a jellyfish sting or a man of war sting for that matter. And there is one last step that will truly alleviate the pain symptoms that I'm feeling in my arm. Good old fashioned hot water. The reason hot water is the ultimate antidote to a man of war sting is because the heat from the water will actually denature the proteins in the venom, rendering them inert, completely harmless. And then it's just up to my body and my immune system to do the cleanup work and I'll be as good as new. Oh my gosh, guys, this is, I've never, had a hot conference feel so good. Like immediate relief. And I hope everybody watching not only enjoyed this little experiment, but learned something to take home with you. Don't use urine, use vinegar to treat jellyfish stings or man of war stings. And at the end of the day, hot compress is going to be your real solution. While I did experience slight discomfort for the next few hours, the scrape and heat treatment reduced my pain to that of a mild sunburn. And by the next day, nearly all signs of redness had vanished and I was as good as new. So next time you're on the beach and you see a man of war, avoid it. But just in case you don't, some white vinegar and a hot compress seem to do the trick. So yeah, you should leave your pee in the toilet. What's going on everybody, I'm Mark Vins. Today we're back in Costa Rica for another special adventure brought to you by our friends at B&H Photo. And I'm particularly excited for today's adventure because we are looking for one of my all time favorite land animals, the poison frog. And not just one poison frog, two poison frogs. The strawberry poison frog, and my personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. And the reason I wanna find and present these frogs to you today is because I wanna talk about just how toxic and dangerous these frogs really are and Mario is gonna give a special demonstration on how we get those really cool macro shots of a small creature like a poison frog. But first things first, we have to find some. 
today we're gonna search just around our lodge here because this whole site is full of bromeliad plants and those are perfect breeding habitats for these species of frogs. So they tend to hang out pretty close by. As a matter of fact, I hear one right now. I'm gonna film on the GoPro, you guys follow me, and with any luck, we're gonna catch two frogs really quickly. Okay, I think what I heard was actually the strawberry poison frog, also called the pomelio. And I heard it coming from right over here. Oh, there he was. I saw him right there. I'm gonna try to not disturb the habitat too much. Ah, and this one might have gotten away. So the frogs do have burrows in these masses and they have really great escape routes. They're particularly hard to catch too because they jump with a non-rhythmic motion, which means uh, they don't really have any synchronization at all to the way they hop. That was our first miss, but we did see a strawberry poison frog there. Let's keep looking. We are in the right spot. So these frogs are terrestrial, so what we're looking for are low-hanging branches and leaves that they can find cover around, and that's typically where you find these poison frogs. Oh, got one, got one. There he is. Oh, I fell. Don't move, don't move, it's right here. I'm gonna let it work its way out, and I'm gonna go for the grab. Ready, got a shot? Got him. Woo, ha <laughs> ha! All right. Ready for this? Here we go. Strawberry poison frog. We got one. All right, that's part one of two of today's adventure. Next up, the green and black poison frog, which is a little bit more difficult to catch than this one. So for now, let's, uh, let's get a container. Going to make a little micro habitat for this frog for a little bit. Some covers so it feels comfortable. There we go. All right, let's go find a green and black poison frog. All right. Good news, bad news. The good news is we caught the first frog we we're after today, the strawberry poison frog, and a really good one too. The bad news is we're in the rainforest and that means sometimes it's gonna rain. And there is a rainstorm coming in right now, so we're gonna let this shower pass by. There is a little blessing in disguise. This moisture is probably gonna bring out some of the frogs we're looking for. So all we have to do is wait a little while and then we'll be back at it trying to find the green and black poison frog. All right, taking a quick break. So the rainstorm has passed by, which is good news. Also good news because all of a sudden the rainforest has come to life. We're hearing tons of frogs calling right now. Can you hear that? I can hear about six or seven different species distinctively right now that I wasn't hearing before. So this is a really good sign that we may come across that green and black poison frog a little sooner than we thought. Now the call of the strawberry poison frog is a little more distinct and a little louder. It's like a rip, 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 rip kind of sound. The uh, Green and black poison frog is a duller kind of and it's definitely a lot less audible. So we're gonna have to listen as we search along this edge. So unlike the uh, strawberry poison frog, which I was able to sneak right up on and catch, the green and black poison frog is definitely more elusive and shy. So I'm gonna have to be looking a lot further ahead than the other species. I've actually never caught a green and black poison frog myself. So this is a pretty special day for me. This is my absolute favorite species of poison frog. I've been obsessed with these creatures since I was in third grade. Um, and this is really a dream come true to be out here today in Costa Rica, finally getting hands on with one of my favorite animals, if I'm lucky. Okay, nothing here. Let's keep moving this way. Wait a second. I heard one. It's gone. So faint, I heard it for just a second. Let's move over this way. There's one. Where? Big one, right there. It's right here? One. Yep. Oh, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. Got him, ha <laughs> ha! Oh man, all right, I don't wanna lose him. Let's go back over here. This is a big deal. Oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> no! Got him, got him, got him, got him, let's get away. Oh man, this is a big moment. My first ever green and black poison frog. Look at that. I have been dreaming of this moment since I was nine years old. Look at how beautiful that frog is. Now we have both poison frogs that we wanna take a closer look at today. Let's put this one in a container and take a look at both species side by side. Coyote's not the only one who bleeds. I bleed blood. That whole 
bush that I just caught the poison frog in was full of uh, spotty plants. Ouch. Woo! Okay. Well, there we have it. Poison frog versus poison frog. We are gonna take a quick look at the differences between these two species before we get into the macro photography. So first things first, it's pretty obvious that we have a size difference here. The strawberry poison frog is more often than not a lot smaller than the green and black poison frog. We can also notice they have very distinct coloration differences. And I have to say, look at how beautiful these two poison frogs are. They truly are the jewels of the rainforest. Now, they don't just look this way to impress us. There's actually a reason why these frogs display the colorations that they do. This is what's called aposomatic coloration, which is a warning sign to predators that says, don't eat me, because if you do, you're gonna eat a whole mouthful of toxins that I have in my skin. Now, we're gonna get to how toxic these two creatures are in just a minute, but before we do, let's talk about a couple other differences in behavior. So they parent in very different ways. The strawberry poison frog, which genus is Ophega, which means egg eater, actually takes their tadpoles once they're hatched out of the egg deposit them in a small reservoir of water. This can be in a bromeliad plant, this can be in an empty coconut husk, this can be in a hollowed out log. And once the tadpoles are in there, the female will go and deposit unfertilized eggs to feed their offspring. And this is the primary food source for these tadpoles until they reach maturity and become frogs. With the green and black poison frog, their parenting is a little bit different. The male will actually carry the tadpoles on its back to a water reservoir like a bromeliad or a hollowed out log and they will deposit the tadpoles at different times. Now, because of this, the tadpoles have different stages of maturity, and while they are good parents, they're not the greatest brothers and sisters because these tadpoles, unfortunately, often cannibalize each other for resources because unlike the strawberry poison frog, which feeds on eggs from its parents, the green and black poison frog is completely reliant on its surroundings, so it's gonna eat other insect larvae, algae, and mites that might crawl around the surface. Time to answer the question you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about the toxicity of these two poison frogs. Which one is more toxic? The short answer is, it's pretty hard to tell. But for human beings, both of these species are considered, get this, non-threatening. And that's exactly why I'm able to hold both of these and present them for you here today. All I need to do after this presentation is wash my hands with soap and water, and I'm going to be just fine. Now, that being said, there are varieties of poison frogs in South America that are potentially dangerous and even deadly to human beings. And we're actually gonna be going on a trip to Colombia later this year to try to find some of those. So while neither of these frogs are potentially threatening to human beings, they are both very toxic for their would-be predators. So I think we've taken a pretty good look at both of these little gems of the rainforest. And now it's time for Mario to step in and show us some of the cool tricks of the trade and how we get those awesome macro shots with some of our specialty lenses. Mario, you ready to step in? All right, let's do it. Okay, cool. Okay, so we had to make a quick move there because the sun started to come out. And uh, believe it or not, despite being toxic, these frogs are actually very, very fragile. So for the well-being of the frog, we wanted to move to the shade. And that being said, Mario, how do we get these macro shots? We're gonna be using this setup right here, which is the new Canon EOS R and our favorite lens, the macro 100 millimeter Canon L series. So in order to get these really tight shots, uh, a few things have to be in our favor, light and stability. So we like to use a nice sturdy tripod in order to get the stability we need in low light conditions. One of the reasons why we really love this 100 mil macro lens is because of its amazing image stabilization. A lot of times we may not have the most heavy duty tripod and we have to use lightweight gear. So that extra image stabilization is critical. So I'm gonna start recording. We've got this dual pixel autofocus, which means any little movement will actually be tracked. Now, unfortunately there is some movement in just holding this animal. It is very hard to keep still, but as you can see, we're already achieving that really fine detail that macro photography actually will allow. So how am I doing? Am I staying steady enough for you? You're pretty steady, but I think we are done with this guy. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on to the green and black. Okay, cool. Now time for the all-star. My personal favorite, the green and black poison frog. Man, nine-year-old Mark would be very, very pleased with how today's going. In, in the world of macro, uh, we went from the little strawberry dart frog to this one. Mm -hmm. This is bigger. So now I have to actually adjust a little bit, at least for the distance. Uh, we want to get kind of its entire body in frame. That blue shirt with this contrast of the green and black looks really nice. 
Thank you, Mario. I'll take that as a compliment. It's amazing you could actually see its respiration. Beautiful. So macro photography is definitely a team effort, especially in a situation like this where you have one person holding a specimen and one person getting the video. Great thing about these cameras, of course, is you could also get your still images from them. Okay, got both frogs back in hand. Mario, you ready to get the thumbnail? Yeah. And since this episode is comparison of two of our favorite species of poison frog, we're gonna do a head-to-head -head comparison for the thumbnail. Let's, let's get a green background. Man, what an awesome day. Catching a strawberry poison frog is always a great day, but I have to say for myself, finding and catching my very first green and black poison frog was truly a special moment. So thank you for being here, Mario. That was Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. And I do want to say a special thank you to b &H Photo for sponsoring this adventure. And here's some good news. They put together some awesome gear and deal packages just for our audience. So if you go to www.bhphoto.com forward slash brave right now, you can take advantage of those deal offerings and get outside and make videos like we do. All right, let's let them go. Right now, I am out tide pulling in Eastern Australia in search of the deadliest creature on the planet. The blue ring octopus has one of the most toxic venoms on earth. And if we're lucky enough to find one, I'm going to attempt to touch it with my bare hands. But first things first, let's get looking. From experience tide pulling, the best results are usually from the edge. The further out you can go, the better. An octopus can change the texture of its skin and it would just look like any of these. Now I've struck out on all three previous occasions trying to locate a blue ring octopus. I'm hoping fourth time's a charm. The difference this time is I'm searching with my good friend Miller Wilson, who has seen blue rings in these tide pools before. It's very hard to pick a octopus that's a master of camouflage out from this environment. It's about to be low tide, and this is probably one of the most dangerous tide pools that I have ever searched. So wearing some nice protective shoes, gloves, I don't really want to handle the octopus, but the gloves should protect me just in case. And of course, we still need to watch our steps because if you look at this, all these rocks out here, exactly like a stonefish. And this is stonefish territory. The stonefish is the world's most venomous fish. If you step on one, your boots will not protect you. A single sting from a stonefish can be excruciating and can even be deadly. But no octopus. Flipping's not really doing it. So I'm just gonna cruise to cover a lot of ground, looking for movement. A lot of times I do see octopus moving from pocket to pocket, but they slink along the surface. So I'm just looking for any movement right now. Any movement, we're getting it though, feel it. Oh my God, I got an octopus. I got a blue ring, guys. right here. There it is. I missed it. It's right in here. It's right here. How could I miss that? That was it. Got it. Oh my gosh. We got one. Are you kidding me? Yes. Boom, baby. Boom. Yes. Holy cow. Miller, we're good. We got one. Can you help me get out of the net? So you'll see I'm wearing gloves, guys, for a reason right now. This is, this is a really good way to get a nip. That is not what I want. Let's talk about what we found. Right there in my hand is the most dangerous animal on the planet, at least when it comes to venom. Nothing in the animal kingdom is more toxic than this tiny little octopus. And yes, I am nervous about it, but before the end of this video, I will officially touch with my bare hand the most dangerous and toxic creature on Earth. There are actually four described varieties of blue ring octopus. This one is the blue lined octopus. It's the only one in the family that has these really cool, vivid blue pinstripes 
surrounding the body. It's almost like blue tiger stripes. So if this animal is at all threatened here, I wanna show you what it does. See that? Look at those rings go. Is that cool or what? Oh, 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 okay. Stay down, stay down. If the octopus is at all agitated, not only does it flare up the rings on its arms, but those lines on its body glow. Back up, I'm toxic. That's your abosomatic warning. And if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna give you a nip. And they show these vivid display warnings, not only for predators, but they also do it while they're hunting. They will do it to confuse or startle their would-be prey. This is what our octopus friend here is out hunting. This is a type of shore crab, but this would be the perfect food for the octopus. All right, we're gonna let this crab go. A single bite from this octopus could kill over 20 human beings. Needless to say, if I get nipped by this creature, that'll be the last nip I ever take. Now these octopus are nocturnal and they are masters of camouflage. It's normal color pattern perfectly blends in to this silty environment. They have three hearts that pump blue blood. They also have nine brains. One central brain to run the entire nervous system, but then at the base of each arm, they have another brain. And you can see there that little beak holds two venom sacs. And it's actually a toxin that it doesn't even produce itself. And it actually picks up through bacteria that it finds in the environment through other organisms in this tide pool. And it collects this bacteria in its saliva glands. And when it uses its beak to bite into its prey or a predator for escape, it will actually inject saliva into the wound. Once this saliva enters the bloodstream, you get infected with TTX. No animal has as lethal of a dose as the blue ring octopus does. If you get even a micro amount of TTX in your bloodstream, all you can do is be put on life support and hope that eventually your body works through the toxin on its own. And here's the worst part about it. While you might be in complete paralysis, you are lucid. There are survivors that have lived to tell the tale of having people try to resuscitate them, giving active CPR, and they weren't able to communicate, but they remember everything. And a lot of people get bitten by these octopus because of mistaken identity. You'll come out to a local beach in Tidepool. Guys, turn your cameras right now. This is an active beach. People take their dogs and kids and play on this beach, and these animals live all along the coastline. Now, that's not to scare you. Obviously, we're out here actively looking for them. They're hard to find, but people do unfortunately come into contact with these octopus and they will pick them up, play with them, and in that process, take a bite, which is completely painless, by the way. Initial symptoms are going to be things like tingling, difficulty breathing, difficulty thinking, loss of your motor skills, wobbly walking. If you think you are ever bitten by a blue ring octopus and you start to have symptoms, you have to be rushed to the hospital fast as you can. We're talking like life flight situation because you only have a matter of minutes before your whole nervous system starts to shut down and you're no longer able to breathe. And saying all that, while holding the octopus in your hand, it's hard to remember the last time I was this nervous in the presence of an animal. All right, the time has come for something that I've thought a lot about. Because I know the only way that this octopus has the ability to envenomate you is a bite with its beak. I'm going to attempt to touch with my bare hand the most lethal, toxic animal on the planet. In order to do that, I'm gonna just dump out this water. Look at that. The octopus is trying to mimic the color of the cube. Rest assured, this is just a camouflage tactic. They are masters at this. That octopus is still very much able to pounce and bite. They can spend extended periods out of water. All right, so just so you guys know, uh, if this blue ring does snare me, we're going to the hospital on three. One, two, three. Oh. That made me nervous. All right, lid back on. I don't think I was just bitten now, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. 
I have to take a break guys because like I'm definitely feeling a little lightheaded like major anxiety that animal right there if you get bit it's game over it's lights out guys I am like shaking right now like my feet are tingling things that you normally wouldn't pick up on like heart rate how I'm breathing tingle feeling I got just from like all the adrenaline pumping through my body um, and the the emotions are intense, super intense. Whew, gotta shake that off. The anxiety that I'm experiencing on camera is real, as I had almost identical symptoms to that of a blue ring bite. While I was 99% sure I wasn't bitten, we had to closely monitor my symptoms until we deemed it safe enough to continue filming. The symptoms of these bites can be subtle and can be hard to differentiate from anxiety and panic from other sources of stress. Please. Never attempt to do what you are seeing in this video. I cannot stress enough, if you are bitten by a blue ring octopus, you must seek medical attention immediately. I think I'm all right, I think I'm okay to continue, let's keep going. Okay, I, it's been a while since I've had this kind of reaction to being in an encounter with an animal. Like it's like my first time seeing a venomous snake. It's like whew, all kinds of emotions right now. Just brushing up against one in the tide pool while you're walking around, if you accidentally touch one, you're gonna be just fine. It's like every other octopus. The difference only occurs when you take a bite from the beak right there. What's going on everybody? And welcome back to another Blue Wilderness Adventure here on the edge of the Caribbean Sea at night. Now we're at Grand Cayman Island and we did come here to swim at Stingrays at Stingray City. And that was awesome. We saw all kinds of cool reef fish and of course got up close and personal with those giant rays. But if we truly want to see something unique, something really bizarre, the best time to do that is at night. So what we're going to do is we're going to get our dive gear ready, head out into the darkness of the sea, and get up close with some of the most alien looking creatures you can imagine. Before we can make our descent, we had to swim away from shore out to deeper water. The visibility along the way was poor and churned up by the waves, making this process much more nerve wracking than usual. Plunging into dark water is without question disorienting. And it isn't until you regain your visibility and bearings that your instincts to turn back retreat and allow you to press forward further into darkness. My eyes struggled to scan the empty space around me for a glimpse of anything. But just like that, we have our first visitor. Drawn in by my camera lights, I find these Caribbean reef squids stunning and very interesting to observe. Oddly enough, it actually might be as equally interested in me. They can be quite the characters and are extremely intelligent. It's mesmerizing how its bright coloration and translucent skin glimmer as it flutters its fins against the dark, inky water. Isn't it incredible how it can remain in perfect position with so little effort? Closely related to octopus and cuttlefish, these torpedo-shaped cephalopods have 10 appendages set in front of two very large, complex eyes. And while Caribbean reef squid are normally social creatures, seeing one all alone isn't that uncommon. Wow, they really are something. What an interesting creature to kick off tonight's dive. It's a surreal sensation to descend into the black abyss of the ocean at night. Some would argue this scenario would easily rank as their greatest fear, and I wouldn't necessarily blame them. Your first night dive can be scary. Luckily, our camera lights are strong and almost create a force field, literally pushing back the fear of the unknown and establishing the reality that exists in front of us. I learned long ago that a strong sense of curiosity can be the best defense against any fear. Curiosity, like our dive lights, can illuminate our minds to focus on what we can see instead of imagining what figments may exist beyond the shadows. And in this world, almost anything my light touches brings my curiosity to a boil. 
The weightlessness of diving, combined with this foreign landscape, feels like nothing less than a space odyssey. So in the spirit of worlds beyond our imagination, tonight we are on the hunt for something truly bizarre, as I hope to encounter the aliens of the reef. Between the maze of shapes and spectrum of vivid colors that make up the coral reef, its inhabitants are equally as colorful and unusual. And as I get closer to the reef, many of the smaller creatures start to reveal themselves, like this arrow crab. As are most of its other crab cousins, this one is an opportunistic feeder hunting for worms and other easy prey items. But if that doesn't look like an alien, I'm not sure what does. Okay. Let's move on and see what we can find on the other side of the reef. Oh wow, so in complete contrast to the arrow crab, here we have a huge reef spider crab, also known as a channel clinging crab. This species of spider crab are commonly found in waters off of Florida, the Bahamas, and various Caribbean islands, but this one is by far the largest I've seen. We're currently at about 60 feet below the surface, but these crabs can actually be found, get this, in excess of 100 feet, a depth we don't often explore for marine life. But maybe we should search for some deep water creatures on a future dive. The walls of the reef are really impressive, covered in brightly colored sponges that tower up at steep angles, giving way to flatter coral beds. Wait, what was that? I heard a crunch like some sort of popping sound. Whoa, that's what I heard. That grunt just smashed that smaller... Oh, and look at that, there's an octopus. Did you see it before it changed color? That's a Caribbean reef octopus, and a big one too. This is definitely the all-star creature of the night. Now they can be extremely difficult to find, but once spotted, will flicker with color. And these color displays are remarkable. It's both attempting to blend in with the reef to camouflage itself, and just when I get close enough, does that. That is a defensive display. See it flash white and blue and balloon up to appear larger than it really is? It's incredible how adaptive these creatures are. Not only able to change color, but also able to change their shape and skin texture completely. Seeing these behaviors is very rare. This is actually the first time I've ever witnessed it. Now let's talk about danger. All octopus are venomous, including this one, and use their beaks to inject their prey with a toxic saliva that paralyzes them while they're consumed. However, unlike their smaller cousin, the blue ring octopus, this species does not have a lethal bite when it comes to humans. But besides their venomous ways and bizarre appearance, these animals are indeed strange. Having three hearts, 360 degree vision, and possessing inexplicable intelligence has some scientists suggesting that these creatures are indeed aliens from another world. In fact, there are few fossil records to suggest otherwise, but we'll save that debate for another video. Okay, well our computers are telling us it's time to return back to the surface, but what an epic way to end our adventure. For more photos and videos of this dive, Make sure to follow me on Instagram, at RealMarkVins, and I do respond to questions, so make sure to comment and ask away. Wow, that was by far the biggest octopus I've personally ever seen out here in the Caribbean, and by far the biggest one we've ever featured on this channel, and it showed us all kinds of crazy displays. I mean, it changed color a dozen times. It went from blues to reds to oranges to stripes, and then it had those brilliant dominance displays where it ballooned up and tried to make itself look bigger on the reef. That was incredible. I cannot believe we just witnessed that. And how about that Caribbean reef squid? That's nothing to shake a stick at either. That was pretty awesome to see the bioluminescence cascading up and down its fins. And I hope everybody at home enjoyed tonight's night adventure just as much as we did. The crew and I are absolutely exhausted. We're gonna get this gear off and head back home for the evening. While a person's first night dive can be a frightening ordeal, I have found that any journey through this mystical landscape will quickly replace feelings of fear with pure excitement. These days, whenever I have the chance to dive at night, I find myself jumping at the opportunity, literally, just as long as my light batteries are fully charged. 
It's about to be low tide for the day out here just south of Boston, Massachusetts. And this is the first time we've gone exploring in the tide pools of New England, the east coast of the United States. We've filmed many tide pool adventures on the west coast, but I'm really excited to get out here today. These will be some debut creatures for the Brave Wilderness Channel, meaning we've never seen anything that we're gonna find today before. To throw a little twist on things, we're going to build another tide pool aquarium so we can get a closer look at some of the smaller creatures that can be found here later in the day. But before we can fill this tide pool aquarium with cool creatures, we've got to find them. And to do that, we're going to grab our bucket, dip net, and a good set of gloves. Let's get into it and see what kind of cool stuff we can find. Here we are, the first tide pool we're going to explore for the day. And I can already see a couple of creatures we are definitely interested in getting a closer look at. Now you'll notice these rocks are absolutely covered in snails. These are a very important part of this environment. It's worth getting a couple of these. Let's go ahead and put those in our bucket. First finds of the day. Tide pooling, in general, produces the most bizarre life forms that we can feature on the Brave Wilderness Channel. Oh yeah, here we go. We got some really good rocks to flip here. Ooh. Ha ha, got a crab. He's trying to pinch me, but I have gloves on. Not today. Getting some really good stuff so far. Looks pretty good. Oh, that is a great sandworm. We will take a look at these here and let them go. And the reason these aren't real great for our tide pool aquarium is they really are subterranean. As soon as we put down some of the rocks and the sand in the aquarium, they're just gonna bury. So because of that, it's better to observe these creatures right here on the surface. But let's get a couple cool shots of these. These are very neat animals, very bizarre creatures. And these are aquatic worms and they can swim. Whoa, creepy. There they go. Very interesting finds out here in the tide pool. Oh, right on my finger. That is actually a great find and is going to be a big part of the story when we build our tide pool aquarium later. I know it doesn't look like much, but believe me, when you learn more about the creature that I have in my hand, you are going to be super surprised. We're at that point where we're looking for the really difficult to find creatures. So I'm always looking for areas that just were recently covered with water as the tide is receding, uh, like this area right here, actually. Let's try this rock, oh boy. That was a heavy one. Nothing new there. All the same. Actually, wait a second. That is a new one. That is the species I was looking for. Yeah! Woo! Got another one. Great! That is perfect. You can let go now. There we go. All right, cool. Haha! -ha. Yes! We found quite a bit so far. Flipping rocks. I think it's time to get out the dip net and try another tactic. Uh, I like this pocket here, this pocket looks really good. See how there's this low overhang? That low overhang is great refuge for a lot of creatures that might be swimming in there. We wanna do this fast. And just got a lot of snails on that one. Try to get underneath a little bit better. Oh yeah, there we go. Those are shrimp. Perfect. Look at that, that's a good one. We've got seven species so far, and I feel like that is pretty good. I think if we got one more for the day, we are ready to build our aquarium. Nope. Ha ha, I got it. That is exactly what we were looking for, folks. Okay, great, that is perfect. Okay, that's gonna conclude the searching portion of today's tide pool adventure. Now, let's make it back to our base camp and set up shop. Woo, man, that was perfect. Oh man, I didn't think I was gonna find that last one. Before we start introducing any of the creatures themselves, we need to sort of build up the environment. Let's make the habitat look like the tide pool environment that we just found these creatures in. So. The first thing I'm going to do, because this is a rocky environment, is just get some of this coarse sand. This is pretty much the look of the environment, and we don't need a ton. And I think the first one 
that we're going to add also has an organism on it. This right here is a blue mussel. And these are the exact same mussels that you see served in restaurants. They're a big part of the marine sustainability out here in New England. These mussels actually attach themselves to rocks just like this using sticky strands called bisel. Bisel is what mussels use to affix themselves so they're not washed away by the tides and the crashing waves in this environment. I'm gonna put that down in there. So let's work our way smallest to biggest with all of these type of animals. I got a few shrimp, so let's put a few shrimp in there. We will have a better chance to see them. There we go. A shrimp, which of course is a crustacean, feeds on small zooplankton and other animals, is definitely part of the cleanup crew here in the tide pool environment, but they're really cool looking. They've got a almost a zebra stripe to them, blue claws, and almost transparent. You can see all of the insides, much like a glass frog. I can see everything going on in there. Very cool addition to today's tide pool aquarium. Now, these are none other than our favorite little friends, the hermit crab. And hermit crabs are crustaceans that use snail shells that are now vacant to call their homes. And they actually look a lot more like a lobster than they do a crab. They have a long hooked tail that helps them wedge their way into the shell and stay tucked in but as you'll see very soon, they'll start crawling around on the bottom of the tank. In my left hand, I have what is called a periwinkle. And a periwinkle is a very common snail species here in New England and in these tide pools. And in my right hand, I have what is called a dogwinkle or a dog whelk. And believe it or not, the periwinkle in my left hand is the favorite food of the dog whelk that's in my right hand. And I have to say these dog whelks are voracious predators. They will affix themselves to a bivalve like a clam, and then they will use their spiralized tongue to drill into the shell just like that, and they will slurp out their meal over a long period of time. It's pretty crazy if you ask me. Here we go. Time for the all-stars of today's tide pool aquarium. We have not one, not two, but three species of crab. This is a first. The smallest crab is an Asian shore crab. It's got really sharp claws. And then of course, two decent size pinchers right there. Now this is one of the invasive crab species here in New England. They obviously called the Asian shore crab, come from Asia. And uh, you can identify them because they have three spines to the right and the left of each eye. Even though it's invasive, these Asian shore crabs are certainly, ah, he's pinching me, established at this point in time. So it will make a great representative of today's tide pool aquarium. Look at that, right in front of the rock for the camera. All right, time for the second species of crab for the day. This fuzzy little crab is none other than the Jonah crab. And this is a native crab. And you can tell because it doesn't have three or five spikes next to the eye. In fact, if we can macro in there past the fuzz, you would see that it has nine spikes on each side of the eye, three in the middle. The three I can actually see right there in the middle. But this Jonah crab is supposed to be here. Very cool. Okay, welcome to the Tide Pool Aquarium. You make a great addition. What we have next is none other than the voracious predator of the tide pools, the green crab. Look at that crab. And this is an absolutely beautiful one. They come in a few different color morphs. This one is green and it has purple claws, purple tip claws. And I can tell it's a green crab, whoa, because it's very feisty, number one. Definitely, ah, it's pitching me oh, on both sides. Okay, okay, I'm not wearing the gloves anymore, so it definitely hurts when you get pinched, ah! These crabs prey um, upon mollusks and the other food species that the Jonah crab that we just saw relies upon. So they are an invader and a threat to this environment. Unfortunately, they have taken hold because they've been here for over a hundred years. And the reason I got two green crabs today was not to get pinched more, which is undoubtedly going to happen. Whenever you hold two crabs, you often always get pinched. So we have both a male and female green crab so the way I could tell the difference uh, between a male and a female crab is by looking at the apron. The narrow apron is the male, the wider apron is the female. 
They do get a lot bigger than this. Green crabs can actually grow up to four inches from side to side on their carapace. Of course, that's the top of the crab shell. And they can actually stay out of water for nearly eight hours at a time, uh, which is a lot more than the other crab species here, making them a very invasive and robust predator of this tide pool. To cap off today's adventure, let's put them in there. Let's now add a few embellishments. We've got some bladder rack seaweed, a very cool plant that you'll find here in New England. The reason it's called bladder rack is because it has these little bladders of air that help it float to the surface when the tide moves in like it is right now, so that that way they can get closer to the surface to attract more light and they do need to photosynthesize to eat. A couple of really cool shells to just add the finishing touch. And there you have it. And the tide has returned. So I guess that's gonna be about it for today. I hope everybody at home enjoyed this East Coast tide pool adventure where we built another tide pool day aquarium. Now we're gonna take a couple of photos and then release all of these creatures right back where we found them. I'm Mark Vins, be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, let's get a few pics and let them go.